Um, so first of all, um, could you give a brief description of your research? Yeah, so the lab focuses on uh, metabolism. So we look at metabolism in both human diseases as well as in plants and algae. And so metabolism in humans, if there's errors in it, then you end up with a disease like uh, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, um, or other metabolic diseases. And then in plants, we're interested in it because if you can control that metabolism, you can control the energy. And the energy of plants can be used for biofuels. And so we, we work on both of those types of systems. Okay. Um, what inspired you to do this research? Um, inspired me to do the research. So as a graduate student um, at Syracuse University, I started working on a class of enzymes. Um, and um, I'm a biochemist. And so biochemists are interested in how proteins can do their job. And you know, the proteins in a cell are sort of like the molecular machines. They do the work in the cell. Um, and as a graduate student, I got interested in a certain class of enzymes called phosphatases. And phosphatases are enzymes that remove a phosphate group off of something. And so then when I went to do uh, my postgraduate uh, work, there was a gene that was identified as um, when it was mutated, it caused a human disease called Leporis disease. And that gene turned out to be a phosphatase. And so that's sort of how I got interested in this, this rare disease called Leporis disease. Okay. So um, I read, uh, it mentioned in your research, some different preclinical um, trials mm -hmm. that are like for therapeutic strategies. The one that you sent me about with the VAL0417 mm -hmm. um, infusions. How can those kinds of preclinical trials and different therapeutic stuff that you're looking at impact the medical world? Yeah, so our ultimate goal is to get a drug into patients. Um, and, you know, if we do that for this disease, it would be uh, an incredibly big deal because these patients, they develop normally until about age 12 to 15. They have an epileptic episode, and then those episodes increase both quantitatively and qualitatively over the course of their, their life. Uh, and so then around age 25 to 30, 100% um, of the patients die either a massive epileptic episode um, or of um, respiratory issues. And so by the time the kids are diagnosed around age 20, uh, most families um, have additional kids and those kids have a 25% chance of having the disease. And currently there's no treatment or therapy for the, for the Leporis disease patients. So this would be a first in class therapy if we get through the preclinical hurdles. Uh, and then moving on from Lafora's disease, we see that, the, that this type of therapy may be useful for other types of epilepsies. So Lafora's disease is very rare, but epilepsy as a whole affects one out of every 100 individuals. And so the hope is that this therapy could be applied to other types of epilepsies. Um, you also mentioned research in cancer. Um, is your, fo is your lab's focus right now more on Lafora's disease? Or what research have you also done revolving around cancer? Yeah, so we, we just published a pretty big paper on cancer, um, lung cancer specifically. And again, it comes back to metabolism. So both Lafora's disease and certain types of cancers have errors in metabolism. Um, the metabolism that we're looking at is sugar metabolism. Uh, and so, we identified some commonalities between this rare epilepsy and something that's much more common, which is lung cancer. Uh, and the discovery on lung cancer, we wouldn't have been able to figure out if we hadn't studied the rare disease. So this is a, a good example of why it's important to, to fund research into rare diseases, because you never know how that's going to apply then to much more common diseases. So do you think there could be applications to other common diseases as well? We do, yeah. We know uh, there's about a half a dozen different diseases that we're exploring right now. Um, and uh, some look very promising. Um, and you know, what we found in Lafora's disease now becomes the prototype of how to both study these other diseases, but then the tools that we've developed for Lafora's disease, like the VAL0417, 
uh, we envision it being able to be used in other diseases. So we have mouse models of, of the cancer and, and some other diseases now that we're testing that treatment in to see um, how uh, effective it is in okay. those diseases. So your research is very like um, instrumental in the developing medical world. Yeah, so I, it is now. With the last, I've been working on Lafour's disease for about 15 years. Oh. And the first 15, the first 12 years were really defining, you know, the gene encodes a protein. What does that protein do? And then figuring out what's the mechanism that's causing the cells to have a problem in that disease. Um, now we're to the point where we can take advantage of that basic foundational research and come up with um, therapeutic opportunities for the disease. So again, it's a good example of it, science takes a long time. Right. You've got to build that foundation and then you can attack the disease. And then hopefully you can learn from one disease and apply it to another. So um, you mentioned earlier that you got into this with research in graduate school. Was there any research in undergraduate school that got you interested in this as well? So I, yeah, I did my undergraduate work um, at a small liberal arts school in Indiana, University of Evansville, and they didn't have undergraduate research. I mean, I think that's a, a big difference between some small liberal arts schools in UK. Uh, mm -hmm. The UK students have a great opportunity to get into labs. I, I've got five undergraduates in my lab right now um, that are doing, you know, cutting edge research and getting mm -hmm. exposed to that. Um, I didn't have that as an opportunity back then, so I, I missed out on that. So would you be looking for more undergraduates to join your lab? We are, yeah. We're constantly, um, our lab as well as, you know, there's a lot of labs here in the biochemistry department that um, are doing equally exciting work on different mm -hmm. diseases, and almost all of the labs are, are interested in having undergrads there, um, on both paid positions as well as for Bio 395 or okay. Chem 395. Do you have any uh, tips for getting involved in these labs? Yeah, tips for getting involved. So, I mean, I think the um, on my web page, uh, which is outdated, but we're, we're updating, um, <laughs> ha it has a a list of things to do. So one, put together a, um, a resume or CV. You know, it has your, what you've done, where you've been. Um, and number two, which I think is, is incredibly important, is putting together an email that is well-worded, right? And then number three, do a little bit of background work on, on the lab, see what they work on. You know, uh, a couple doors down, the guy's lab works on heart disease. So at least mention that in the email and say, you know, I, I looked at a little few of your papers and this was, found this really interesting. Um, wondering if you have a position available. Uh, and I would say, you know, do that as early in your career as possible. Um, two of the guys in the lab started their sophomore year and then just had four start two men and two women, and they started first semester of their freshman year. So you don't have to have a lot of experience to, to get into the lab. Okay. Um, and then my last question mm -hmm. is, um, what are some of your tips to success in your field? Tips to success? Oof. Um, so you have to be able to accept failure, because science is a lot of, there's a lot of failure. Um, most of your hypotheses are wrong. And you've got to be able to, to push through that and not let that discourage you too much. Um, you, have to, you have to work pretty hard. Um, there's, it takes a lot of hours to, to do the experiments and think about them and set the right ones up and then analyze the data. Um, and then third tip, for, uh, I would say the third is to, do you really have to know the literature? So you, you, you have to know not only what's been done in that field for the last two to five years, but what's been done in that field. In the case of Lafour's disease, it was described in 1911. So what's been done for the last 100 years? And how can you leverage what other people have found to make you work smarter? It's not always about working harder, but it's about reading that literature, seeing what's the right experiment to do, and then doing that. Well, thank you so sure. much. <laughs>